Hello, everyone. Um, I'm, my name is Marjorie Good, or Marge Good, I go by. Um, I am a nurse consultant with the, the Division of Cancer Prevention within NCI. And in that role, I'm a nurse consultant working with um, uh, NCI grant-funded community-based research programs, um, of which there are about 46 across the U.S. now, and, and one in Puerto Rico. And um, I actually came from a community-based program, which um, um, has really helped me um, with this new role as, to help new sites that are coming on board. Um, I was with a program in Wichita, Kansas, um, actually, and did that work for over 20 years, managed um, the research program there, which was quite busy and active. We actually averaged usually uh, between 600 and 800 patients uh, enrolled on clinical trials in a year's time. So um, we were busy. We um, um, was heavily involved in, in clinical research, and with that, I um, came away with a lot of knowledge that I, I like to share with as many as possible. So today is one of those efforts um, to, to let you know um, a little bit more about data management and the development of case report forms. And I know that there's a varying degree of ex expertise as well as job roles, I think, that will be participating in this training. So I kind of tried to base this around that uh, with that in mind. So um, some of it may seem really basic to others and, and, and maybe a little bit above um, standards for others as well. So. Uh, um, happy to take questions at the end. So today I hope we can discuss the importance of the proper data collection efforts, um, identify the types of data collected for clinical trials, list potential sources uh, that uh, can be used for source documents for that data collection, uh, name key factors to consider during case report form development, um, discuss things that we need, really I think are important to consider uh, when you're developing CRFs. And I add a little more information with this one for my last presentation as a request of some of the comments after the presentation. So hopefully that additional information will be informative for you as well. I also want to then uh, cover what constitutes a poorly designed case report form. So hopefully it'll give you, inform you not to go down that road. Um, then we want to talk about um, data management itself, uh, which is quite large. When, within that, it's going to, I like to review the audit processes themselves, describe adverse event reporting, and then describe some uh, very lightly um, on regulatory requirements for data collection. So the use of data is very, very important. Um, data analysis and reporting, um, the actual capturing of the data is what informs the analysis and the reporting, the publication that goes on after the study is completed. Um, it's a method of tracking the patient or the subjects. It's used for FDA safety monitoring. Um, it's used in new drug application submissions. It supports those labeling claims uh, for new drugs that have gone through the FDA process. Um, it's reviewed by data safety monitoring boards uh, to assess the trial safety and ongoing uh, activity. Um, it's used in publications and medical journals, and it definitely helps to inform future development of trials. So the actual data management reporting, um, it's the outcomes of the clinical trial are dependent on this data that is collected, and it needs to be collected accurately and in a timely manner, and needs to be verifiable. So those are the things we're going to kind of talk about today. It, data must also reflect the actual aims of the clinical trial, um, and it must comply with regulatory agencies. And really, all of this is key. You're going to get all this information if you have adequately designed case report forms. So basically, there's this old adage that I hear still frequently, you know, it's, it's garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have good case report forms, you're not going to get the data and the information that you need. The research team is, plays a really vital role in this process. Um, they can be made up of such uh, um, levels that I've listed on this slide, the principal investigator, clinical research nurse or CRA, the data manager, database administrator, and statistician. All these people play a key role. However, there are other people that can play a role in it as well, depending on the type of study that you're trying to conduct. It, it, uh, you also may need to include radiation oncologist, um, nutritionist, um, caseworkers. It just, again, depends on your study that you're trying to develop. Um, but part of the main thing to re remember here is, a, is the principal investigator really does play a key role. Um, he's responsible, he or she is responsible for all aspects of the trial. 
including the ethical conduct of it, of the research, the eligibility, protocol adherence, adverse event reporting, and the reporting of timely and adequate data. It's a lot to carry, but it's, uh, it, it, and PIs and principal investigators need to be aware of these roles. They also determine the response to therapy and intervention and determines whether the adverse event may be uh, attributed to the actual agent or drug that's used in the trial. Each member of the team, however, does play a key a role in um, conducting research ethically, maintaining confidentiality, and following the Code of Federal Regulations, and complying with HIPAA. So in order to do that, training is essential. The protocol is often considered a roadmap. It's a document that includes um, information, and hopefully it's written clearly so everyone understands that, but it provides info regarding why the study is being done, the hypothesis behind it, the aims and how the study is going to be conducted to meet those aims. The protocol should contain sufficient detail so that there is uniformity in the selection and treatment of patients and uniform data collection and submission. So things to consider when you're developing the protocol. Um, what data elements are you going to be collecting? Um, what is the design and the content of the data collection instruments then that need to be considered to capture that data? And then what type of computer database are you going to be utilizing? Common data elements is a, is a term that's uh, often used, and um, it, it's actually quite important in, in uh, um, developing your case report forms. Uh, there are uh, elements that have been determined to be identical between projects and contexts, and examples might be name, age, gender. There's not too many ways to define those. They tend to be fairly common across studies, um, so they're considered common data elements. Um, and I'll go a little into a little bit more detail as um, we go further into this discussion, but um, they really do help to facilitate the understanding and sharing of that information across studies. So if someone else wants to replicate or, or do a similar type of study, um, they would want to use the same data elements, and that would then inform maybe a future meta-analysis that would, someone would like to do. Meta-analysis are much easier to do when there are common data elements uh, being used between trials. So at study entry, some data elements that could be captured are the demographic data, eligibility criteria, family history, patient history. Um, um, all of these are uh, pieces of information that are collected at the time of study entry, and each of them may have multiple data elements within them. So on study, each category, again, can contain multiple data elements, and they may consider capturing the treatment the assessments of labs, radiology, things that have been done in the interim during treatment, what kind of concomitant meds were taken, adverse events, hospitalizations, treatment response. And then there are patient reported outcomes, um, forms that may be completed as well, such as diaries and quality of life questionnaires. These are all things you want to consider as you're developing your, your case report forms. Source documents are basically uh, any document where the data is first recorded. It's the inf where the information for the forms, data uh, case report forms, is um, captured from. Um, they confirm the protocol adherence. They confirm the, and validate the data being submitted is actually there and real. It also serves as a data uh, an audit trail, it's allowing the, rec uh, the recreation of the study, and it also confirms the actual existence of the study participants. Um, I think you have or will be having a lecture on scientific conduct, and hopefully within that there were some examples shared regarding um, fraud. And it actually does happen. Some investigators make up patients. And, um, and, and doing an um, audit or uh, actually having source documents um, helps to track and find those issues. So um, source documents examples might be simply as the hospital records, the clinic and office charts that may include various reports, uh, the actual progress notes, uh, including physician as well as nurse notes. Other examples might be uh, letters from referring physicians, actual radiological films, tumor measurements, participant diaries, um, participant interviews, um, and pharmacy dispensing records and photographs. So actual data abstraction then is the anything that basically be, is considered in this is in a, anything recorded on a CRF should be this in the source document. Um, if there's something recorded on the CRF, it has to be tracked back to a source document. And a common um, statement or common um, 
post-it note I or pay, uh, post or I would put around oftentimes for my staff was basically to keep in mind if it's not written, it didn't happen. That's, that's how the auditors will see that. It may have actually happened, you wrote it on a CRF, but if it's not written in the source, it's actually not replicated or found in the source document, then they're basically going to consider it um, uh, falsified information possibly. Any correction or change uh, should be dated, initialed, and explained, um, and should not, the, the original information should not be obscured. And this applies to the CRF as well as the, uh, the um, source document. Um, only provide the requested data. Some um, research staff I've had like to like go on and write a book sometimes, or a lot of information. It's not necessary. Just the CRF should be designed well enough to capture the information that they want. Um, and, and what is needed. Um, and use standard ter uh, medical terminology as well. And um, as far as the corrections and the data abstraction too, a thing to keep in mind is um, I've had occasionally have staff that would use post-it notes and I, I can, it's kind of as a mind reminder for themselves to go back in and make that note, then they forget or they forget to take the post-it note out when the auditors appear and so it doesn't look very good. So post-it notes should be um, not used in these cases. So again, the data abstraction. The auditors, when they come in, should be able to reconstruct that patient study course by piecing together all the data that's obtained from those source documents. So the methods of data collection, um, just to give you a kind of a pictorial view, very simple, of a possible electronic uh, captured form as well as paper. Those are the two main uh, types of forms that are currently in use. Um, a case report form is basically a pre-printed, if it's paper, form developed by the sponsor or the PI to determine the data elements that are going to be outlined in the protocol. It basically translates the protocol-specific activities into data. They ensure there is actual um, standardization and consistency of the data uh, captured across multiple sites. Um, so the data that's collected in Kansas is the same data that's collected in Colorado. Um, design, it, the, the protocol report form, um, case report forms are hopefully designed to impact the quality of the data collected. And basically, proper designed uh, CRS actually streamline audits, make them more easier, uh, and also help with the data analysis and reporting. So I put together a bit of a pictorial based on a, a previous presentation of the actual protocol which describes the, the study conduct. It goes through the purpose, objectives, and operational aspects. And then there's the analysis plan, which is part of the protocol document also. But it, the data analysis then describes the data that's going to be collected, key endpoints that are going to be looked for, as well as the statistical methods that are going to be used to analyze the data. The case report form supports all of those two things. That's, that's how vital a case report form is. So um, I think this, this uh, view of it uh, says a lot. So things you want to consider, I just want to go through several little things to think about um, uh, when you're developing case report forms. Again, the protocol determines what data should be collected. Um, and if it, uh, if it is documented or written on the case report form, it must be collected as specified in the protocol, and that data will not be analyzed. The data will, that will not be analyzed, analyzed should not be asked for. Um, I can't tell you how many times in more in the old days or early years of, of being a, a research nurse, we filled out humongous amounts of data, paper forms, case uh, uh, flow sheets with tiny little boxes where we had to fill in things. I found out years later much of that data was never used really very frustrating. Um, so um, uh, keep that in mind as you're thinking about what data you want to capture. Really, the CRAs at the other end, research nurses, really don't want to be capturing unnecessary information. It also adds extra burden to the, to the patients um, as well because you're collecting extra information that maybe they wouldn't be collecting otherwise. Um, other thoughts, um, the protocol, uh, oh, sorry, I've got to move it on here. Um, Again, it involves, the development should involve various people from the research team. Um, they all are involved in different aspects, so getting their input is, is, is important, um, particularly the statistician and the programmer if you're going to be using um, electronic uh, forms. Um, review the analysis plan. What's being asked for? Um, that definitely will inform your CRF. And then de de look and see, are there previous forms you could model after or even replicate and use? 
So um, again, what data is needed in relation to when the data will be available? Um, think about that. Uh, how many people are going to be involved in capturing that information? If you have a um, data, some information that you need from perhaps the patient level or the patient chart level, um, but you also have other information that maybe you want to capture from a radiation oncologist, those are oftentimes two different areas within a research site. So maybe you want to develop two different forms, one for that patient-focused information and another form for the radiologist to complete. So um, it's all, um, one form isn't lost by it being, uh, information being obtained from another site. So things to be think about. Um, and then again, who's going to be completing those forms? Um, there are various degrees of expertise out there. Um, some CRAs and research nurses are very savvy. Others have uh, not as much experience, so you want to think about that, uh, especially what type of terminology you use and how you're capturing the information on the form. And I'll give you some ideas or suggestions on that as well. Um, the data to be collected and the forms to be used should be clearly outlined, again, in the protocol. Oftentimes, uh, protocol documents I'm used to have a specific section that describes what forms are due when, and also a, even a um, calendar of events that is a one-page form that uh, people can refer to, and you're going to have more likelihood of getting the information back in a timely manner if you, and accurately if, that, if that's utilized. Um, again, it should be clearly stated and self-explanatory, um, and it should hopefully correlate with your statistical software that you're utilizing. Um, I said it again multiple ways. Uh, um, you generate friendly, user-friendly forms, thinking about your audience again. Uh, avoid uh, asking for lengthy text information. Uh, try to get it in uh, specific types, what information you specifically want. Um, and again, collecting only essential and uh, very important to number your uh, or version, uh, keep track of what version you're using. Uh, nothing worse than getting an old version into a protocol document and capturing the wrong information. Um, other th uh, qu uh, points that I found in a recent uh, publication are to use consistent formats, font size, and uh, style throughout the protocol and your CRS. Don't use one version with one form and another with another. Um, use clear and concise questions, prompts, and instructions. And use the option of circling answers is probably not a good idea. Um, instead, check boxes are probably a little, uh, going to get you more accurate information. Um, as I said, boxes or separate lines to hold the answers. Um, again, this helps to inform the person that's recording it or providing you the information. Uh, and I'll give you an example here in a bit. Separate the columns with uh, thick lines. Provide bold and italicized instructions so it stands out separately so people are know what they're look, looking at and reading. Minimize those free text responses and avoid collection of derived data to decrease calculations errors. An example of a derived data would be um, asking for the person that's capturing the data to calculate a BMI, um, and so they're going to use that using their height and weight and age. Um, if it's probably better for you just to collect it, height, weight, and age yourself and then calculate the information yourself. If you're relying totally on that person that's capturing the data to calculate that BMI, you may come back with some erroneous information. So this is a suggestion. Avoid using check all that apply because it, then it really forces that person to make assumptions. Um, specify the unit of measure. Um, um, and I'll show you again an example of what is a good case report for and what's maybe not so good. Um, indicate the number of decimal places you want recorded. Um, standard data format, for example, um, for your year or date of birth is um, DDMMYY, um, very commonly used. Um, and use pre-coded answer sets whenever possible. This really helps with statistical analysis, but it also makes it much easier for the data to be collected. So simple yes, no male, female, and um, for if you're going to have grading or um, uh, uh, levels of uh, information you're trying to capture, make that consistent. So for like adverse events, it's, they're going to choose between mild, moderate, or severe. 
Again, consider using common data elements. NCI has done a lot of work on building a repository or, uh, um, uh, or like we often call it a warehouse of, inform of, pos of commonly used common data elements that we really in um, strongly suggest our research program um, people to use um, and, and investigators um, as they present trials for us to reevaluate. Uh, we want to see common data elements across them. Um, we also really encourage, if it's specifically a new forum, to use um, to consider piloting the forums amongst a few of your outlying sites or research staff to see do they make sense, are they um, bringing home the information that you're interested in, or are we miss are you missing the boat? Um, and then complete that CRF development prior to study activation. Um, it's really important. It's nothing more frustrating for staff to have a study they're anxious to start with, but they're still waiting on your CRF forms. And those CRF forms also help to inform the research site to know how complex and detailed this study is going to be and um, help them to decide what kind of staffing to uh, address towards that trial. Um, there are uh, examples, again, of poorly designed um, CRFs, uh, poorly designed studies usually um, they're not asking for the data that you really want to have collected. Um, it might require modification down the line or down the road as the study after the study is activated, which adds difficulty and complexity to the analysis process. Um, it, de it actually impedes the process. Um, it requires uh, reviewing and cleaning the data through the process um, of analysis. Um, it might. Um, lead to you actually missing target dates that you need, and the, which would really inform your endpoints possibly. Um, and again, if you're collecting too much data, you're really wasting the resources of the collection and processing. And, and you know, any kind of delay in getting that accomplished, you're actually delaying the ability to um, get the answers that you want for in your study. So here's a, just a kind of a simple um, uh, to the left is. Um, an example of a poorly designed CRF where there are just, you're asking for the information, but then there's just a simple line that you're expecting everyone to understand what numbers and what data you want. Whereas on the right, the well-designed, um, there's actually boxes being provided for them to fill in, um, a, a, a followed by an explanation of what those boxes should be. Um, so example for your date of visit, it's the, the day, um, well, in this case, it's the day, day, first, month, month, and year. Um, blood pressure is the millimeters per mercury, uh, pulse beats per minute. Um, this is cl that's clear for anyone who's going to be filling out that form. So you're going to get consistent information back. Whereas the uh, example on the left, you may get all kinds of information back that you're not going to be able to use, or you're going to have to query the sites and get more information for them, and that's just going to frustrate everyone. So to talk a little bit about electronic um, uh, CRFs, this is a mode that um, I think more and more sponsors and researchers are going to. Um, and, and there are many commercial programs out there. I've only listed a few here. There are many more than this. Um, uh, Oracle, Clinitrial, Rave, eClinical, um, they all kind of have similar names but different. Um, and the advantages of electronic data capture are it actually is a much faster mode. You, a research person or a CRA can sit at the computer and enter the data, and it's electronically submitted fairly quickly. Um, it actually, I think, uh, it, um, promotes uh, cleaner data collection because oftentimes they're programmed to query or question immediately uh, erroneous information. If they submit a number that's way out of range for what they're expecting, um, it'll query the person immediately and say, um, did you put that in right? Or maybe they just transcribed it incorrectly. Um, it's easier for monitors and monitoring, uh, auditing, because the information is more clear. You don't have handwritten type things. Um, it's a central database for storage for all trial data. Um, it makes it much easier for statistical analysis. And again, oftentimes allows for real-time data access by the sponsors themselves. There are some drawbacks to it, though. Um, there's Oftentimes, there's lack of on-site technology. I think this is improving, but I still see it, particularly in some of our community-based programs, if they're in institutions, that their um, computer IT systems are not quite up to the level that they need to be to adopt or to adapt to the, the electronic forms that are coming or the system that they're, that's being used. 
There is a high cost to investment initially for sponsors to develop these electronic CRFs. These companies are out to make money. That's part of why they're in the business. So it, is, it can be quite expensive. Um, there is this also a complexity of the installation and maintenance of the software that goes along with the cost. And, and then sometimes investigators don't really, they're not terribly motivated. Um, and and uh, there's a lot of training that needs to be done. So here's an example of maybe what a uh, view, a web view of a form may look like. Um, it looks pretty simple. Um, these little boxes seem like they're pretty simple to fill in, and, and they actually are. And these are. This is actually a fairly good example of what uh, a CRF should look like. Um, but there's a lot of work that goes on behind building this. Um, all of these little boxes have to be pre-filled, uh, usually with an Excel spreadsheet behind the scenes. And this is where you need your programmers and the, and the people on board to help you design that. I, I, I've been involved in some of this, and it's, I'm amazed by the complexity of it behind the scenes work. I'm really happy someone else does that and not me. But, uh, but you have to think about it. There, there is more behind it. And this is where the common data elements comes in, that if you use that warehouse, you can just pull that information into this type of thing. It makes it much easier for you. So um, just a few things to think about. So again, designing the electronic CRF is very similar to paper. Um, you, the method of data collection will again impact the design um, of how those data entry screens will look. Um, the same considerations for designing these forms should be the same as what you've done for paper forms. Again, consider the volume and the frequency of the data that you're collecting. Um, avoid excess detail on the screens. And uh, really important to thoroughly test these out. Um, we've had a few occurrences where a study's been opened and activated, and there is some glitch within the electronic data forms, and sites can't use it. And so we have to um, get that fixed quickly, or else put the study on hold a bit until we can get it fixed. Um, and um, again, I think many of these, and many of our researchers have developed uh, user instructions for these. I think they are uh, vital. So choosing electronic data uh, systems, you think about its scope, its scalability, how is it going to be used over the long term, uh, is it a bit, does it have the ability to adapt and change, um, is it have interoperability between other systems, uh, how secure is it, um, does it have an underlying structure that uh, built well enough, um, and is, there, is it user friendly. The Code of Federal Regulations also does address electronic records as well as signatures, um, and, and uh, reading these codes is important for anyone who's wanting to consider uh, developing these, but um, they basically require uh, at various mechanisms to be employed, such as ensuring that the data is accurate, reliable, and has not been altered. The, the, does the system allow you to check for that? Um, does, can you create accurate and complete copies of the records? Um, went for an inspection or review. Uh, are the records uh, protected and retrievable when necessary? And then is there the ability to limit access to the system, uh, usually by usernames and passwords, so not everyone can access it. Um, another uh, more on the Code of Federal Re Re Regulations. Um, can, you, can they readily identify who's had, who has entered the information? Can that be tracked? Um, and, as, and has that data been modified or changed across the time? This is, again, trying to assess for um, um, not necessarily fraud, but uh, changes. I mean, I think it's important in studies to be able to track that. Uh, monitors and auditors will be interested in it. Um, can, it needs to hold individuals accountable and responsible for the data uh, under an electronic signature, and that in itself is um, I, I, I found through experience with some of our research sites, various programs, various electronic systems that sites have, some have the ability to provide electronic signatures and others don't. Uh, and they also have to be certified programs. So uh, check into that when you're considering developing these and, and considering your research site selection, do they have that capability? And again, training, training, training. That's why you're all here today is training. So it just seems to be an ongoing, ongoing with uh, clinical research. So actual data transfer paper CRFs are usually completed at the site. They're submitted to the sponsor, and then they're electronically entered by the sponsor at their site. So it's kind of a lot of extra work and expense. 
Electronic again, um, they can invest, uh, log in and actually enter the data directly at the site and it allows for real-time data review. There are other methods or uh, things that are collected though, and again, it might be more related to patient reported outcomes or re patient reported forms where the patients fill out things on paper and then they're sent in or transcribed into an electronic system and those might include your patient diaries, any calendars that they might complete, questionnaires, uh, quality of life type forms, um, and any data supporting source documents. So let's talk a little bit about actually managing the data. Um, it really becomes a, uh, a, a system that is a continuous system. The, you know, the data is collected according to the protocol. Hopefully there's some internal quality audit uh, checkpoints at the site. Uh, the data is submitted according to the pro pro protocol. It's uh, reviewed at the data center where queries are often generated, can be generated, we'll talk about that. Um, and then uh, data is corrected and resubmitted, and this is kind of just this ongoing uh, cycle of, of um, data submission. And I think this says, the picture says a lot, but um, I'm just going to give an example for our phase three trial. Uh, there are probably close to 7,500 to 9,000 pieces of data that might be collected um, for a uh, single patient. And so if you take that times uh, a study that may have a sample size of 500 patients, that's going to be over 4 million pieces of data. So it kind of gives you a perspective of, of the amount of work and the uh, importance of, of collecting accurate data when it comes to that level of, um, of uh, effort. So again, I want to talk a little bit about the investigator responsibilities as far as relating to completion of the CRF. The um, good clinical practice or GCP guidelines um, really specifically state that the investigator should ensure the accuracy, completeness, legibility, and timeliness of the data. And that would include that all sections are completed, any alterations have been properly made, and all adverse events are fully recorded and they are uh, reported accordingly to regulatory bodies. So um, timeliness is very important. Um, ideal, I feel, and I've tried to really encourage my staff to complete the data forms as closely after the visit as possible. Um, this is where you pick up on maybe something was missed. Uh, maybe you know it took place and information was uh, stated, but it wasn't documented completely. Um, you're going to remember, they're going to remember to uh, complete that and know the information and record it closer to the visit than if a staff person is waiting to go back in three months later and fill out that data form. It's a little too late to capture the information that might have been missed. Uh, <clears throat> it also in ensures that the information can be retrieved um, or followed up on while that visit's still fresh in their mind. There are problems that are encountered when CRFs are completed, um, and this is very common sometimes. They lack, there might be a lack of source and documentation. I think one thing that we continually uh, found in our site were physicians failing to report in the source document what the patient's actual performance status was. Um, simple, but um, often our auditors were required that number instead of just a description of the activity of the patient. It was, it was a frustrating event. So we developed actually a source document that captured that um, so we could have the information. There can be errors in the uh, protocol, ad adhering to the protocol. There can be missing data, transcription errors, uh, lag in data entry, um, poor patient recall after uh, the adverse events, and uh, also just patient poor, uh, poor compliance. Queries are a um, uh, day-to-day activity if you've been involved in clinical research um, much at all, particularly as a research um, associate or a CRA, um, a research nurse. Um, they basically... Um, um, review the, you know, the, reviewing the activity within the data that's collected. Um, it helps to clean the data um, it, and it helps to assess and resolve some inconsistent data missing or um, range discrepancies, deviations from the protocol. Um, and very commonly sponsors will janet, uh, generate what we call data clarification forms or DCFs um, and they're sent to the investigator for resolution. Um, again, this is more probably common with the paper forms than the, than the electronic, because as, as I said, electronic forms, the opportunity to collect uh, and, or to qu clarify and correct um, issues is usually provided at the time of data entry, but not, not all the time. 
Um, I really hope that any research sites um, um, do have a, some sort of an internal process to review um, their um, research before they have an external auditor come in. Um, to wait until that external auditor comes in to find your problems is not a good idea. Um, to be proactive, um, self-identify your errors, um, develop um, corrective action plans, uh, correct your SOPs or update your SOPs, um, and then uh, this is just really key to preventing non-compliance, um, and it, it helps to then train your staff more appropriately as well, so hopefully those issues are resolved at the time and aren't ongoing. Uh, just a little bit on data safety monitoring boards, because I, I see in your um, um, all your topics for discussion that there is a, a discussion on data safety monitoring boards, but I think it does play a, an important role when you're talking about data management. Um, the data safety monitoring boards are basically boards that are made up of experts that re for, for specific, usually disease categories, that review trial data um, um, and look at accrual rates, they look at adverse events that have been occurring, and they also look at the data reports as, as far as what is the interim analysis showing. They also then, by doing that, might capture issues uh, for trials, if the accrual rate is really slow, they're really going to encourage that uh, investigator to figure out why, develop methods or look at the, what the problems might be and do, uh, perhaps an amendment needs to be made to the study to change something in eligibility that's prohibiting accrual. Um, they look at adverse events. If one arm is a two-arm study and one arm is more toxic than the other, the data management, the data monitoring board might suggest, depending on how severe those differences might be, of um, shutting down one of the arms or even shutting down the study. Um, and doing the interim analysis also helps to assess um, our, is one arm possibly giving better results, our patients. And they usually write this out in their data analysis plan of what they will accept as a um, level of change between arms. If one arm has reached that threshold, they may actually um, shut a study uh, arm down and continue maybe the other arm or um, shut the study down itself. So the data safety monitoring boards really do play a key role in uh, assessing tr uh, trials. Monitoring and auditing are two different terms that uh, kind of get interspersed um, quite regularly. Um, but uh, monitoring is actually more the overseeing of the progress of the clinical trial. It's kind of more of a, a look at the processes in place. Um, and it, you know, it does ensure that the trial is being conducted and recorded and reported according to the protocol. But the auditing is more of that systematic and actual looking at the data and comparing the source documents to the information that's been uh, submitted. Um, is it accurate? Um, is the information there that they need to see? There are various agencies that conduct audits, um, the NCI. Um, um, we have uh, research programs that provide research trials and studies for us to, that are available then to our research programs, uh, sites out in the communities, and uh, the NCI uh, charges these programs, the um, ones that generate the trials, to go out and conduct audits on a regular basis to, on, on our research sites. The FDA has, uh, also conducts audits. Um, it's uh, kind of... Um, um, when somebody says they're having an FDA audit, they, they're instantly stressed. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of uh, information about an FDA audit, but they're important. The FDA has, carries a huge role of trying to decide if a, if a drug is actually active or not. They want to look at the data to ensure that it actually is. Um, uh, the Office of Human Research Protection, or OHRP, that conducts audits of IRBs and regulatory uh, portions of the research. Um, the sponsor itself of the trial will do audits. And um, then there also should be those internal site audits that are done locally. The purpose of an audit, again, is to look at, to, number one, be, uh, determine if the rights, safety, and welfare of those study participants have been upheld. Um, they're there to evaluate the conduct of the trial and protocol compliance. Um, they evaluate the site's uh, standard operating procedures, and, and they help to verify the integrity and reliability of the data. And uh, they also help to determine that all the regulatory procedures have been followed. Um, For-cause audits um, do raise the hairs on the back of your neck sometimes when you think about those because um, you don't want a for-cause audit. They're usually related to sites that may be 
compared to everyone else that participating in the study, for some reason they're having really surprisingly favorable results compared to others, um, might flag a four-cause audit. Um, they've, uh, sites had unexpected high enrollment versus others. Um, the investigator that's conducting a large number of trials, if they're outside of his or her area of expertise, may raise a bit of a red flag for um, a, a site audit. Um, and if there have been an unexpected death or deaths at a particular site, that again may um, trigger a four-cause audit. So what do auditors look for? I think helping to know that will uh, help improve the quality of any program. Um, most audits, are, you're going to look at the regulatory IRB information. Um, they want documentation, the full review, initial review, as well as annual review. They're going to look at your consent documents. They'll look at the pharmacy, drug accountability. They want a verification of the receipt and the storage and security, as well as the inventory control. And the biggest piece or portion that they will review are the patient case reviews. And then again, they're going to be looking at the consent, mostly for signature of the patient, um, that they're completed properly. Um, they'll look at eligibility criteria, the, whether correct treatment was administered, uh, what the disease outcome and tumor response were, any adverse events, and then also they do look at just general data quality. So informed consent, they're going to look to make sure all that the required elements have, are there. Um, most of our trials provide the sites with templates, consent templates, and they sometimes have to modify them to fit local context. Um, however, sometimes in the process of transferring and working with Word documents, some of the information may be deleted inadvertently or copied and pasted into the wrong section. Um, all of those things are audit what auditors will look at. Um, they usually don't complain too much about adding information if, if they feel it's going to um, inf help to inform the patient. However, removing information that was there for information purposes will result in usually a major deviation. Um, was appropriate version of the consent used for all patients at the correct time? Uh, was reconsent um, if the consent or the trial changed significantly enough that required all patients that were currently on trial to be reconsented? Were those patient reconsent? patient reconsents done? Um, was the consent obtained prior to any tests or assessments? And uh, was it obtained definitely before any study medication was given? Eligibility, did the patient meet the eligibility criteria? They're going to go through every one of the criteria and compare it to what the case report form shows versus the source document. Um, and and it, it, it needs to be there. As far as the uh, looking at the protocol assessments according to the protocol, uh, they'll look at the exam, they'll look at performance status, laboratory tests, diagnostic tests, tumor measurements. They'll also look at quality of life um, measurements. Um, treatment, were the, the drug dose, uh, uh, drug or agent administered as it was designed or so, uh, said to be, de uh, to be given within the protocol? Um, if it's an oral agent, was a diary or pill, pill count provided? Um, and they'll also then uh, compare this information to the pharmacy log. Um, was it the drug administered in a timely, um, according to the time of administration, according to the protocol, any dose modifications followed according to the study? And uh, again, they'll look to see if any contraindicated drugs were, were provided or given. Drug accountability. Um, is where the agents properly stored um, in a secured pharmacy area. Um, were they stored by protocol and by study? Uh, they didn't, do not want to put the same drug from different studies in the same box or container in the pharmacy. It really um, allows error, huge errors to occur, so they usually want those things all separated by trial. Um, if some agents are required to be refrigerated or frozen, um, they, the t pharmacy should be able to provide temperature logs to make sure that those temperatures were stayed consistent according to the needs of the drug. Um, a huge issue that I, we run into frequently are those uh, the drug accountability uh, forms. Um, you know, they're busy people, the pharmacists, so they'll go in and they'll write it down and they'll like, oh, they made a mistake and they'll scratch it out and try to fix it and, um, and th that's considered incorrect. A single line through date and initial and um, um, is considered a, w a way to complete an error that might occur on one of those forms. And most of those uh, DARFs are still in paper form. They're trying to convert those over to electronic, uh, which hopefully will eliminate some of those problems. Um, were the investigational agents uh, disposed of properly if, those, if it was, that information was provided within the uh, protocol to allow for that? 
was the study blind maintained? Were hopefully commercial agents were not used? And was the drug inventory completed on a regular basis? We really encourage our pharmacies to do at least monthly checks to confirm that what's on stock matches what's in the drug accountability form. Um, common audit deficiencies, um, failure to follow the plan, investigational plan, um, not documenting uh, information uh, properly, um, any protocol deviations, they didn't follow the protocol according to plan, um, failure to ensure that the consent form was obtained is kind of a, I don't see that as much, I think the one issue we see more frequently are the reconsents not being done in a timely manner. Um, failure to maintain accurate, complete, and current records, um, lack of appropriate accountability for the drugs and provided agents, and then a failure to obtain IRB approval. Not so much the initial, but maybe um, amendments, um, IRB approvals within a timely manner, uh, oftentimes is, is a deficiency that we see within our, um, our sites. Um, Audit determinations, um, usually ca they're classified into two different categories, lesser or minor deficiencies versus major deficiencies. Major deficiencies um, are usually those that um, can impact the endpoints of the study. And, uh, uh, and, and if a site gets many of those, uh, it could put them at risk for continuing con uh, research in the future. So uh, we really work towards educating and informing sites not to, uh, to do the best that they can to build their programs and develop their training systems so that doesn't happen. Um, and then final audit determinations um, usually are in, within three categories, acceptable, acceptable needs follow-up, or unacceptable. Acceptable, that there were very few deviations found. Acceptable needs follow-up, there are probably some major deviations, uh, not enough to be of concern. And um, if a site is doing much research, they will have some majors. It's just inevitable. Um, it's difficult to be 100% correct at all times. Um, unacceptable, however, are um, findings related to lots of major deviations, a large percentage of them compared to what was be expected. Um, and in, with those, depending on their severity, um, usually that requires a re-audit within a year. Um, and uh, if it's severely um, a severe pro problem, uh, the sponsor may prohibit them from conducting future research for a time or, or forever. It really depends on the degree of complexity or degree of um, major issues that were found. So again, looking at the FDA inspection, um, the FDA will come in. They, uh, they have um, a huge... Um, list of things that they like to look at and review uh, during an FDA audit. And it, it is quite labor intensive uh, and work for the research site. Um, and they'll review and then they'll provide the site with what was called an FDA Form 80, 483. And you'll hear a site say, what did your 483 say? Um, and this is what they're referring to. It basically provides a list of observations that the FDA found in the inspection. Um, and the investigator then has to respond to this in a, within a certain time frame. It's then reviewed at the FDA. Um, the FDA makes a final determination and then it issues a response letter. And that letter can be anything from um, not that many issues um, and they observed some basic compliance um, and with pertinent regulations. They didn't, basically didn't find many issues at all to uh, all the way up to a notice of initiation of disqualification and, uh, proceedings and opportunity to explain where the, basically that site's been shut down and they have the opportunity to re appeal or to um, refute it, but it takes a lot of work and effort to, to get to that point. So they do carry a pretty heavy stick. So talk a little bit about adverse event reporting and monitoring. Um, I had to throw this a little bit of a funny in. Um, basically, it, you know, adverse event reporting is, is important. It's a very vital piece to uh, conducting clinical research. Um, it's basically an adverse event is any untoward medical occurrence that may present itself during the treatment or administration with a pharmaceutical product and which may or may not have caused a relationship to the agent. So that's the event. A toxicity is actual adverse event that does have causal relationship. It's basically uh, the agent itself has caused the toxicity. For example, um, our e EGFR agents cause a skin rash. We know a skin rash is a toxicity. There are serious adverse events uh, as well, um, and, or SAEs is a term you will hear. Um, and this is basically any medical occurrence that 
at any dose results in, a, in death or a life-threatening um, event, requires uh, any event that might require hospitalization, uh, may result in a disability or incapacity or congenital anomaly or birth defects. All SAEs need to be reported, um, and they need to be reported as quickly as possible to the sponsor. Um, and, and they also should be comply with regulatory requirements, which is to report them to regulatory authorities, including the IRB. So adverse event reporting, the NCI has um, common terminology criteria for uh, adverse events, or CTCAE. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with that. Um, this is basically a, a rather large document now that allows lists multiple types of adverse events and then provides grading criteria to help you determine what severity that adverse event would be. Um, it also helps to um, determine if the event was expected or unexpected and it um, helps to then relate that information within, for the, is it related to the study intervention. Um, there are ways uh, that um, um, these in, the information can be expedited and reported. The NCI now has uh, CT, CTEP errors or a common system that they use for their trials that information is reported within. Um, the IRB sponsor and FDA also need to be included in the, uh, the again, the re um, reporting of the information. And this is just a quick screenshot of uh, kind of an older version right now. This is still version 4.0, um, but it, it, you can see where it um, lists the adverse event and then pro provides the grading of from one to four, one to five, actually five is almost always death uh, as being the most severe. A point to make with uh, the uh, CTCAE is this, they are, it is a bit of an iterative process. The versions are changing on a fairly regular basis. So when you design your protocol, you wanna, you wanna um, indicate it in it which version of the CTCAE are you expecting the research sites to use. Um, and then the, be able to stick with that as well. And as an FYI, they are looking at actually, hopefully, it's in a review process right now of a version 5.0. I ho don't think it's gonna look a lot different from this, but, but it's in the works, so just be aware of that. Um, assigning attribution can be kind of challenging sometimes, particularly depending on the level of understanding and expertise at the CRA or nursing level. Um, they range from unrelated up to um, definite, with the in-between being unlikely, possible, and probable. Unrelated and definite is sometimes pretty easy to figure out, but it's the levels in between that might be challenging, and this is where I really encourage the investigator to be pulled in and help to make these decisions so the accurate information is provided. There are legal and regulatory issues. Again, I think you're going to get at several of these um, other presentations you're going to have will cover these in more detail, but just to be aware that there are, are various regulatory agencies, and I'm going to provide you some uh, uh, slides that provide the actual links to these, but to be aware of them, to um, go in and check them out, um, it, there's a lot of information to learn. Um, regulatory documents are also often based on um, the Belmont Report, the, there's the, there's, which is an important document. Um, there's the Code of Regulations, which I've addressed and um, shared with you on previous sites. And then another really important document is the um, International Conference on Harmonization or the Good Clinical Practice Guidelines, GCP. Uh, as far as the Code of Regulations, I tried to narrow down maybe some more specific ones to look at instead of trying to dig into the entire code, which can be quite overwhelming. Um, so I'll provide those for you here on this slide. Um, and then the um, GCP is also a fairly large document. So I think if you um, can um, hone in on the section labeled E6, um, I provide the um, web link here for you as well. Um, and these, this E6 goes through the basics principles of GCP, goes through trial management, uh, safety reporting, quality assurance and quality control, records and reports and monitoring. This is a, like the backbone of, of information provided to help sites be educated and understand as well as investigators and researchers should all be very familiar with GCP guidelines. Um, many of you are probably also familiar maybe with the regulatory documents and, and many sponsors require these um, to be captured within a actual study binder or some sort of uh, combined uh, document. They may include um, 
the study itself as well as any amendments, um, the drug brochure, the forms 1572, which is a really important form for investigators to complete, um, all the CVs of the personnel that are listed on the 1572, any IRB information or approvals, correspondence, the, all the IND safety reports and the site safety reports that have been submitted to the IRB. Also should include the IRB approved consent documents, any advertisements that have been used, the IRB membership list, um, investigational drug inventories, um, telephone logs that may have been used um, to document the tracking of what's gone on with the study, any copies of lab certifications, uh, CLIA reports, um, logs documenting CRA visits as well as signature logs and then the closeout letter would all those documents would be included within the regulatory documents or the the binder. NIH also does have documents that they like to have um, if any of you are the NIH employees which many of you are that you'll be familiar with these you know the human subjects protection training um, conflict of interest docu documents um, disclosing finance um, interests as well as um, the Data Safety Monitoring Board plan um, is included with any of our grant applications that we have as well as um, all our research programs are required to have that. Um, what is the data sharing policy as well as um, how to adequately include, plan for and include minorities, women and children within your research. Record retention, um, how long to de Determined to keep records is a question I often receive. Um, when the, some of these studies go on for years and years, um, these research sites can have a lot of, of data, a lot of records that they have on and, and storage, and it can become quite expensive. Many of my uh, sites are now transferring that information uh, into an electronic capture system by scanning and uh, trying to reduce the burden, but it's difficult to find concrete information on what timelines records should be retained. Um, there are some minimums though, that, and, and usually the sponsor will define that, but for minimums, um, two years uh, following the, the date the marketing application is approved um, for any investigational new drug is, is a standard, and um, if the application is disapproved, then the data should be maintained for two years after the shipment and delivery of the drug for the investigational use um, is dis dis discontinued and the FDA is notified. All IRB records should probably be maintained for at least three years after the study is completed. And some of these studies can go on for many years, so uh, that's a, a long time to maintain. Um, as far as follow-up and analysis, um, you know, no further participant enrollment. Um, is it is a, a, a time point that a follow-up is um, needs to be determined how long does that need to go out um, um, how much data needs to be collected during this phase hopefully just minimum amounts because the you know the funding is going to be far less at this time point um, think about data queries in preparation for the final analysis once the once this um, is completed the data is frozen um, and, and you can't enter, sites can't enter more information into the data system, so um, they want to get that information in before that time point. And then the study closeout is a, a, an intense review that, again, is done by the sponsor, um, in which they review the regulatory documents, uh, they look at any outstanding CRFs and queries, they look at the drug inventory, they verify that all AEs and SAEs have been reported to the IRB and the sponsor, um, any remaining drug is returned and then arrangements for the drug story, record storage are discussed and determined. So basically there are some key pieces that to keep in mind as far as guiding principles of data management. Again, designing CRS in accordance with the protocol and doing them in a method that uh, makes sense and are uh, user friendly are key. Um, standardized data entry procedures and processes, stay organized. Um, I, you know, being a compulsive, I think, is a key attribute for people who are inv involved in research because they tend to be the ones that want to pay really uh, strong attention to detail. Um, don't get behind because it's so difficult to get caught back up. Easier said than done. Um, and then thorough and complete documentation is key. And again, I provide you some resource websites that you can use as well as some additional references for um, uh, some of the information that I provided within the slides, you can go to these and uh, review it in, in more detail if you like. And so with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions anyone might have. Okay, I'm not 
seeing any questions, which is just fine. We're right at the end of the time period. So I thank you for your attention. And I think um, if you come up with questions later, there's the opportunity to send them to me. I'll be see what I can do to happily answer those as well I can or find the answers for you. Thank you.